Alright, right, time to start the day. And if you follow me on Instagram at RealMeetKevin, you would have already known that I went on a run this morning. Now somebody in the comments said I should be further away from the camera. So know that in today's video, we're gonna talk about how you could start with real estate at 19 years old, and I'm talking about investing in real estate, not even being an agent. In fact, go do whatever it is you do and go to college, but this is how you could start at 19. Cause that's what I did. And yeah, if you didn't already guess, this one's gonna be a vlog style educational vlog. See the playlist? And no, don't worry. This isn't gonna be about wholesaling real estate either. <laughs> this is how you can actually get into real estate and own it. Honestly, all these courses on wholesaling, we're gonna have another video coming up on this. Biggest bull. Look, and I'm not saying that People can't make money with wholesaling. So, but if anybody knows a thing or two about wholesaling, they know that it's all involved with taking advantage of the real estate agent. So just make sure that you throw that realtor some money, you know? You know? Guess how many wholesalers I shut down all the time. I'm moving in close to the camera now, so sorry for that one person that didn't like it. A lot. I'm coming up with a camera! <laughs> well, where's Jack? I found Max. Hey Max. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> ah, good morning. <gasps> He's right there. What's up, Jack? Oh. oh. <laughs> what? It's just a finger. It's just a finger. Calm yeah. down. Hey, Max. That's the camera. Here you go. Thank you. Mornings are the worst, so hectic. Everybody sends emails starting at like eight. That's why I like waking up at 4.30. Cause everybody leaves me alone. Today we're talking 12... So today I'm doing an educational vlog style video on how you can buy a house at 19 because there are a lot of people that leave comments that say, hey, how do I get started? And really you could do this at any age, but I really wanted to make a video targeting people that are in college and there are some really neat and interesting features about that position. Step number one, <gasps> tree step. <gasps> Look how big that thing is. Kevin, myself, and this huge tree stump are here to tell you today about how you can acquire a property at the age of 19. Step number one, this sounds really basic, but you gotta save money, like fifteen to $25,000. I was so anxious at the age of 15 to get my first job. I had to go to a local coffee shop because all the chain stores don't want to hire a 15-year-old in California. So I had to go to a local coffee shop and I got my first job there and I worked about 15 hours a week and I started saving then. And it helps to have a girlfriend who saves early because we kind of combined our funds, which you'll learn about later in this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kevin really brought me down though. You didn't start saving at 15. Well, first I met Kevin when he was 16 and I actually applied for his first job. For me. <laughs> yeah. That was after what we call my pre-job when I worked at Hollister and uh, Lauren quit for me. <laughs> yeah, I acted as his uh... She was my legal assistant. Yes. <laughs> Actually really surprised they just did take you off the schedule. So I acted as if I was some type of recording for you, right? And I said something like, hello, I am calling on behalf of Kevin Paffrath. <laughs> like it's a fill in the blank. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Paffrath will no longer be working for the Hollister company. <laughs> and then the, then the manager's like, okay. <laughs> oh god. Oh, oh. Ready? Step number two is you gotta start building credit. It's so important. Lauren does property management. She sees all the time, oh, well, I'm in my 20s. I don't have credit yet. I'm too young to have credit. Yeah, sorry, you ain't getting the rental place. Well, the same is true for buying. You have to start establishing your credit. Do it at 18. We both went into a special place to open up our credit cards on our 18th birthday. Lauren, where do we go? It's a really, really unique bank called Wales. Fargo. They're actually really easy to get a credit card from when you're 18. They're kind of like, yeah, sure, we'll give you a credit card with a $500 limit. And we're like, okay, <laughs> just pay it off every month. Pay that religiously. I think we, we each probably paid it off like three times a month just to make sure we'd make the payment. I just played back that clip to review it and my leg looks so massive because it's at the edge of the lens. That wide angle lens is just like disproportionately larger than the rest of my body. Careful for the mud, Lauren, careful. And the bikini over there, who's, who's is that? Number three, I hate to say it, you have to have a job. <laughs> and it's not for qualifying, we're gonna talk about that later. But the most important thing is have a job so that worst case, you know you can always at least make the payment. Your housing payment is $1,500 a month and you make $2,000 a month, that's fine. And I'm not suggesting that you wanna be that tight all the time, but this is when you're 19 years old. 
If you're making 2,000 bucks at 19, that's great. Lauren and I each made about 900 to $1,000 per month when we bought our first house. So our payment was $1,900 and we were making just $2,000 a month. We weren't expecting to only make $2,000 forever. And even if it's a nine to five job, I know that nine to fives have a bad rep, but it's really, really good because it's a secure job. You can rely on that money. And of course you could get fired or something happens, but for the most part, you know you work these many hours per week and you make this amount of money per hour. It's predictable, unlike self-employment, especially at 19, yeah. it's very difficult to make consistent money at 19 in self-employment. Take advantage of consistent employment. Like Lauren said, yeah, can you get fired? Of course. You could also get hit by a bus tomorrow or somebody could walk up to you and stab you and kill you. you know, that just happened in Ventura, by the way. That literally just happened. Yeah. I get a little upset when I hear so many videos on YouTube say, ah, quit your nine to five. Take advantage of that predictability your nine to five gets you. Buy a house. Hey, hey Lauren, was that too aggressive? Am I being too passive aggressive about that? I hope not. I don't, yeah. I don't think so. It's Bye. passion. That's it. They all say have passion, especially passion. excitement. Especially that guy in the comments that said, move away from the camera. You're scaring your audience. <laughs> it was, I made a mistake, okay? And I thought, you know, just kind of giving you like some closer insight was better. <laughs> Um, yeah, just like you said though about the nine to five. I mean, it, people will always say, "Oh, get away from the nine to God, Gavin." <laughs> they say, "Get away from the nine to five job." But the realistic truth is, so many people have nine to five jobs. So let's actually talk about it and let's work with those numbers and the benefits of having a nine to five job. I honestly wish I had a nine to five job because I feel like I work eighty hour weeks. You know what, Kevin? You at a nine to five job would still figure out how to fill up the rest of the hours that you got off work and then do something else. You were just a special, special. Human. Okay, now we're gonna check out a staging job that I just did. I just want to make sure everything's perfect before we take the photo. Partial stage. Partial stage. Yeah. Before we take the photographs today. Yeah. This is a tip for anybody that's trying to stage or decorate their home. These IKEA shelves are super awesome. They're only $120 each, and you can get any type of decor and put it on, and it just really gives a cool effect for putting it up against a wall. The funny thing about staging, and everybody asks me this, like, oh, it's uh, staging, it's, you must have like a really, really nice house in your home. Yeah, I do like how I decorated my home, but staging is completely different from actually living in a place because it's not functional at all. Like, why would I waste my valuable counter space for this little tray that literally gives no purpose at, at all but to look nice? And same with this. I mean, I'd be putting a blender, I'd be putting a toaster, so no, my house doesn't look like the staging jobs because it doesn't make sense to actually live in a staged house. These are fake. Another thing about functionality versus what looks good for a staging house is I would never in a million years have light tan couches, especially with kids and this light rug. It would make no sense at all. That would be stained in like a second at my house. But it gives a really, really nice open light effect in any room. And this furniture really can go in any house. Again, sorry for my appearance. Kevin didn't tell me we were filming again today. I thought I was just gonna work on a staging Film job. every day. I don't. Every day. Again, Kevin, I'm a mom. <laughs> Come on. Where's your mommy vlog? What? No. Meet Lauren. Hey. <laughs> so now that I looked at that other staging job, I have fully approved it. It looks very good and it's ready for, for photography. Uh, we're on to the next where I am staging, partial staging, another family room and a dining room in a house that's about 20 minutes away. Step number four is having a fallback living space. Our fallback was worst case if for whatever reason we weren't able to make extra money or live off the rest of our savings until we increased our incomes over time, we would rent the property out and move back in. With the mommy and daddy. <laughs> Which they did charge us rent, but it was like 200 bucks. Oh no, they didn't charge okay. me rent. Excuse me, they charged you rent for living with my family. <laughs> yeah. We want to make sure that that property can rent and cover as much of that payment as possible. Yeah, have it that game plan inset, whether it be with a friend, with aunt, with your mom and dad, whatever. Just know you can always fall back on something where worst case scenario, you have to evacuate. <laughs> Now beyond having a job and mommy and daddy's fallback, which we say that because we definitely made use of it, it's also a good idea to make sure that you can afford the payment. Don't get a $4,900 payment because you can make it happen with the advice that's coming up with the rest of the advice in this video. Number five, even though some of the advice that we're gonna give later in this video means that you can actually get a higher payment than really what you're making, you don't want to be in a place where you're not comfortable with the payment because ultimately you need to make sure that everything goes okay. So the reason we got a $1,900 payment when we we're only making 2,000 is because we knew our incomes would be going up. We just 
wanted to get in. And we're gonna talk about exactly what kind of property to buy. You don't have to start out extravagant. It's okay to start out with a condo or townhouse or small house. You just wanna start somewhere so you can start building that equity. I always told myself, even if I had to quit my new real estate career just to make the payment, that's what I would do. Check out some of the before pictures of the house that Lauren is staging right now and see what Lauren's doing with it right now. Hello, Lauren. Wow. It's really important with staging when you're working with a really tiny living room for this smaller house to make it seem like, oh, I can fit yeah, a really like good size sweeter. couch in this area or I can fit the couch in the two chairs. It's like, wow, I actually can make a lot of this tiny, tiny room. It's hard to see now because I have a lot of my decor on the dining table, but this is an extremely tiny dining space attached to the kitchen. And this, this table and chair set usually has the two chairs at the end. And what I did just to make it seem like it makes sense is I took the two chairs away and just had the two chairs on one side have a bench that can tuck in and then it makes the whole area seem like it makes sense with the size of the dining table. Now we're going to talk about step six. That's where... Hi! Where'd you come from? <laughs> Hidden bathroom off of this bedroom. What? It's a mirror? Wait, no, it's a door! <laughs> The step six option for a fallback is to get a roommate, which when you have an attached bathroom, it makes your life easier living with another person because it's not really fun to share bathrooms with people. That's the thing, if you have a place that has two bathrooms, you should be able to easily get a roommate that could take the guest bath and rent out a room, around here at least, rent out a room for $700 to $1,200 yeah. per Depending month. Depending on it if just it's depends. the master or if it's just one of the normal offshoot rooms. Yeah, it's around exactly. 800 bucks. Yeah. yeah. We have some clients that go into buying a property knowing that they're going to get two roommates that extra income and it yeah. halves their payment often it's incredible yeah, yeah it's smart if you have to do it it's totally smart i think that was something we were considering doing oh it totally was when we moved into our first place we thought okay absolute worst case scenario we move back in with mommy and daddy but we thought if an in-between step were to happen where we're like oh we can make it but it's super tight we could always rent out the two rooms we had a three-bedroom house so we could rent out the, uh, the two extra rooms did you stage that monkey right there i didn't stage any of this part i just staged that front dining area and living room part. Now I got my vista back. Yeah, you got a window in this room. Oh my gosh. I live for a vanity like that. Hey Lauren, look what I did with the blinds. I made it so you can't see the neighbor. I noticed that, yeah. This is probably the hardest part. Number seven, you gotta have help. I'm sorry to say, when you're 19, you probably don't already have two years of work experience. You probably don't have the qualifying income anyway. So this is what you need to do. And don't feel bad either, it's totally normal. That was the place Lauren and I were in. We couldn't qualify alone. So here's what we did. We found a family member with a little debt, a decent credit score, and enough income to help us qualify. The very important part about this is you have to remember to start building your credit. Remember the credit step? You gotta start building it because everybody who goes on the loan to get the best pricing has to have at least a 740 credit score. But it's okay, as long as you're above 700, you should be fine. You don't need an 800, in fact, you don't even get any benefit having a 741 or an 800 it's all the same so don't worry too much about having that perfect super high score just get it over seven as soon as you can find somebody you can qualify with who also has it over 700 and is okay also being on the hook for the debt so you better not mess them up okay because these are gonna be people who might be able to help you set up future deals as well so here was our example we bought a house for three hundred and five thousand dollars the total payment was 1939 it was a cosmetic fixer totally needed a bunch of work it was a foreclosure and my father co-signed with us. So he didn't put any of the down payment down. That was all Lauren and my savings. And instead, he just helped qualify for the loan. In fact, they used a zero for my income, but we still made it happen. Still bought our first house in 19. And today, it's a rental property. Oh, extra note, if you have a bunch of student debt, qualifying can sometimes be near impossible because the student debt payments really kill not only your qualifying ability, but even if you bring a cosigner on that has little debt themselves and they have a great job or even just a decent job where they can prove income, your student loan debt could kill it all. Same goes for credit card debt, car debt, any kind of debt payments will lower your ability to make this happen. So you need to build credit, but not build debt. Housing debt is different. Point number eight, to minimize your chances of you getting screwed and the people that lent you money getting screwed or the people that co-signed with you getting screwed basically to minimize all your chances of failure here's what kind of property you need to buy the ideal property to buy is one that is cosmetically dated as in it's got shag carpet wallpaper acoustic ceilings original kitchens 
original bathrooms, all that stuff sucks. But, and I love to buy these properties, they've done the expensive stuff. They put in a new water heater, they put in dual pane windows, they've replaced the roof recently, they've replaced the heating and air system. These houses are dime a dozen out there. Guess who the only people are you're gonna compete with? You're not gonna compete with other home buyers because 98% of home buyers, they don't go for this cosmetic stuff. You're gonna compete with flippers. And guess what? You'll win every time. Why? Because you can pay more. A flipper has to build in their selling costs and they have to have their margins so tight so that in three or four months they can put it back on the market and try to make 20 or $30,000. When we bought our first house, it was listed for $287,500 as a foreclosure. And we paid 305 for it because there were two cash flipper offers on it for full price. And guess what we were putting down? Three and a half percent. And they went with us because, well, yeah, we paid like 17 thousand five hundred dollars more which was a lot but we didn't care I mean today the fact that we paid that much more does amortize to like virtually nothing we haven't sold the property and we have no intentions of selling it we're just gonna keep renting it and when we do sell it we'll exchange so we'll always be able to beat out a flipper especially since flippers have to pay short-term capital gains it makes flipping very very expensive just to show you an example you guys see this carpet Nobody wants carpet like this. Well, under the carpet in this house is this hardwood flooring, which looks like this. However, this hardwood flooring looks old. It doesn't look that great. Look what $3 a square foot got us with a professional hardwood company. This refinish. So the point is, get something cosmetically dated that most people won't want, and not only are you going to be able to fix it up yourself, probably for way cheaper than what the market discounts it for, but because the market discounts the prices of cosmetically dated houses so much, you could actually buy something for 3%, fix it up, and end up with 20% equity after your fix-up costs, because the market just discounts cosmetically dated properties so severely. Step number nine, you need three and a half percent of your own money. You put three and a half percent down on an FHA loan. You can have what's called a non-occupant co-borrower. That means your parents are now able to co-sign with you, qualify for the property, and they don't even have to live there, but you get to live there. Yeah, do you have to pay mortgage insurance? Yep, don't worry about that. Step 12 has a solution for that. So just a little bit of perspective on what three and a half percent down means. That means if you get a $300,000 property, you control, you put down just $10,000 $1,500. Now, are there gonna be some closing costs and some fix up? Of course. Would it be nice to have $20,000, $30,000 around or just keep saving so you can fix it up over time? Absolutely. But the bank says you just need $10,500 and you control a $300,000 piece of real estate. That is awesome. That's America for you. And you should take advantage of it because if you're not taking advantage of it, that's fine. I'll keep buying those deals. <laughs> but I just thought I'd share it and put it out there that worked for us. I'm not saying it works in every scenario. Again, we're not saying you can't lose your job and have problems and then you know have to figure out how to make up to your parents that you lost this house that they co-signed on that would be bad ideally your parents are also in some kind of position where worst case if the market fell their jobs are not subject to the market so that the payment can continue to be made or whatever payment can be made just long enough to get the property rented that's always your fallback roommates are a fallback and the ultimate fallback is just renting the whole thing out but you got to get in to control it and the only way you can get in with three and a half percent down is you have to say you live there. And that doesn't mean just say you live there. No, no, live there, move there. But if you lose your job and circumstances change, that's okay, then it's okay. Let's say you lose your job, fine, move out, no problem. Then the bank doesn't care. The bank at that point just wants their money. You have options if you buy the right deal. A really good cosmetic fixer that has its systems upgraded is a score. Now, what about taking title? Well, if I can find the deed, I'll show you. And I have to always disclose when it comes to taking title. You can't give financial advice, I'm not an attorney. You should consult an attorney, blah, blah, blah. okay. You don't have to take title proportionate to how much money you actually put into the deal. When Lauren, myself, and my father took title on that $305,000 deal, I got 49%, my dad got 1%, and Lauren got 50%. You could do whatever combination you want. You could do yourself 99%, your parents 1%, 50-50 with your parents, uh, and then you'll solve that in step 12. Sorry, I know it's late now. Step 11, do some fix up yourself. Learn how to do drywall. Look at this, bought myself this beautiful set when I fixed my first washing machine. Fine multi-master, some tools, 
bent this conduit myself. Even wired up my little Tesla charger all by itself. Now I know this is supposed to be in conduit, I haven't gotten to it yet, but got my little GFCI breaker here, right? All these things, you know, surge protector, whatever, they're things that I've done myself because I like to know how to do things because then I know the value of things and I know when I'm getting bids, how long something should take. There's a value to doing something yourself. Take a look at some of these pictures from that first house we bought for $305,000. Every time that my mind slip, I just see my past life Having dreams in a dream, I wonder I learned so much and I'm so grateful that my father-in-law encouraged get in there and work. There's so many people willing to share their construction knowledge with you. And if you don't have somebody, guess what? Go do some electrical stuff after watching some YouTube videos. Don't turn the power on yet. Pick up the phone and call an electrician and say, hey, 300 bucks. Just give me 45 minutes of your time, which is like a way over payment. Anybody will come help you out. Safety check all my work. Tell me and teach me what I did wrong. Quick lesson. Now you got a safety check on the outlets and switches you did. You gotta figure that all out yourself. I don't want you to burn your house down. Maybe electrical's not the place to start. What I'm trying to say is, it's an idea. Step number 12, the final one. You bought a cosmetic fixer, you've built equity in it, now you do a refinance, and you officially own the entire property. Because ideally, by the time you refinance, your income's gone up, you could qualify for the, the house yourself, and your equity position's gone up because hopefully the market's appreciated. But not only that, you bought a great deal and you finished fixing up the property, and now you can get appraisal for more money. So you refinance and you get rid of that mortgage insurance. That's exactly what we did. See, we bought in 2011 and refinanced in 2013. Mortgage insurance, gone. So there's a special loan program called the FHA 203K, which is totally a topic for a different video. But basically, the bank let us finance $50,000 to fix up the property. Look at that, with 3.5% down. America is ridiculous. So what if you fail? What if the market falls? If the market falls, hopefully you've built enough equity so that you can sell as you're realizing that the market's falling. But even if the market falls to a point where your upside down as long as you can rent the property out you should be okay and there really shouldn't be a reason why you can't rent the property out and that's all i got for you oh but wait if you're still here whose uh, caricature is better uh uh